Hello world, it is indeed your boy Satonic. I'm trying something new today. As you might remember, if you've stuck with me for a while, some time ago I did the week web segment. Basically, every week I went over cybersecurity related news that was hot topic at the time, broke it down and gave you my take. Admittedly, I didn't do it for too long. I can't remember exactly what happened. I think something just came up one week and for whatever reason, I decided to drop it. Nevertheless, I am henceforth resurrecting it, this time with better stock footage. So whenever I'm dissecting a major hack, I have some super cool video of some dude at a computer looking like he knows what he's doing. I mean, just, just look at this guy, eagle-eyed, staring down a GUI of a world map with some random text on screen. What does that even say? V virus progress. My dudes, I think he's about to launch a cyber nuke. Better buckle your seatbelts because the first item on our itinerary this week is WhatsApp just did a major doo-doo. Admittedly, this was last week, but anyway, let's not get bogged down in details. WhatsApp recently updated their privacy policy to make it impossible to use the app without sharing your personal data with Facebook, their parent company. Though, does it affect you? Is it even a big deal? And why are a lot of people feeling somewhat betrayed by WhatsApp? Well, to understand all of this, we have to go back a few years. No, not that far. God damn it. Anyway, sorry, sorry. Back, back to the video. Though, there's a really interesting story behind all of this, so I think it's worth exploring. WhatsApp was founded in 2009 and eventually acquired by Facebook in 2014 in efforts to help expand Facebook's user base outside of America. When this acquisition went down, understandably, there was a lot of talk about what this meant for privacy. Will Facebook be able to read my messages? Are they going to start tracking users in the efforts to push Facebook ads further down our throats? At the time, WhatsApp CEO Jan Coombe wrote a blog post titled Setting the Record Straight, defending his choice to sell his company to Facebook, in which he basically explains how he grew up during the time of the USSR and free, unfiltered communication, free from worry about the KGB listening to your phone calls, just wasn't a thing back then. He details this is why WhatsApp just values privacy oh so much and says if partnering with Facebook meant we had to change our values, we just wouldn't have done it. That sounded all well and good in 2014, though this romance between Facebook and WhatsApp really didn't last too long. As just 18 months after the acquisition, WhatsApp started sharing some of users' personal information with Facebook. Now, this obviously didn't look very good, as Facebook kind of promised that they wouldn't do anything like this prior to buying WhatsApp, but then they just went and did it anyway. And so Facebook was actually fined over 100 million euros for these misleading claims. That's, that's some hefty coin. Shortly after this, in 2018, the WhatsApp CEO left. But why did he leave? Well, of course, NDAs are a thing and people really just don't want to burn bridges. So the narrative at the time was just the standard, this was great guys, thanks for having me, but I want to move on, kind of a thing. But it was reported at the time that the WhatsApp CEO's exit was actually highly unusual and that there was a massive culture clash between the WhatsApp and Facebook teams. This shouldn't come as too much of a surprise though. The WhatsApp co-founder, a guy called Brian Acton, also left and subsequently endorsed a hashtag delete Facebook campaign. Pretty weird given he had just taken part in selling the company he co-founded to Facebook, though he did donate $50 million to Signal, a rival messaging app. More on that shortly. The problem Facebook faced is that WhatsApp, sure, it had a hell of a lot of users, almost 2 billion now, though only, I, I say only, 500 million at the time they were bought. The problem was, how do you monetize those users? Of course, Facebook being Facebook, the solution they've come to is ads, ads, ads. Not necessarily putting ads in WhatsApp itself, yet, but instead collecting personal data to help better curate ads that users are shown on Facebook. If Facebook can serve better, more targeted ads, then Facebook makes more money. This brings us to the present day. What's changed now? What's all the drama about? Well, previously, WhatsApp gave you an option to opt out of Facebook data sharing, but they've done away with that altogether now. So, so what information are you now sharing with Facebook if you choose to use WhatsApp? The content of your conversations are still end-to-end -end encrypted, so no one can actually read your messages other than you yourself and the recipient. Instead, it's the metadata that is now going to all be siphoned off to Facebook by default. 
This includes a trove of data, including your phone number, logs of how often you use the app, IP addresses, your OS, browser details, etc., etc. Now, sure, it's a far cry from actually monitoring the content of your conversations, though if privacy is really important to you, then even this metadata is potentially a step too far. All of this information they collect could be used as a digital fingerprint to track you. Though, to be honest, I don't think Facebook wanting to collect this data should come as a massive shock. I'm almost surprised they didn't do it from day one. After all, targeted ads is how Facebook makes money. Though the whole reason people aren't too happy about this is because Facebook initially said WhatsApp would remain its own independent company, that Facebook wouldn't look to integrate its data collection into WhatsApp. And people do tend to get somewhat attached, I suppose you could say, to the services and devices they use. That's why you have iPhone people and Android people, WhatsApp people and Signal people, etc. So for WhatsApp to just come out with this, a lot of people do feel like they've been betrayed. Especially if everyone you know uses WhatsApp, it's quite hard to just switch to something else. Good news though for Europeans, if you're in the EU or the UK, then this new change doesn't actually apply to you because of the whole GDPR thing. So this brings us to the question of, should you even use WhatsApp when there are perfectly good alternatives out there like Signal? The main difference between the two is Signal is owned by a non-profit company, so they aren't looking to make money from your messages. Signal is also end-to-end -end encrypted, just like WhatsApp, but it's open source, which means you can go right now and download the Signal source code for free. This has the side effect of making it even more secure. Given that the source code is freely available, it's completely open to scrutiny by anyone. So it'd be comparatively harder for a vulnerability or backdoor to go undetected in Signal compared to WhatsApp. In the last few days, search traffic for Signal has skyrocketed with people looking to make the switch. And even Elon Musk tweeted his support for the app. So do leave a comment for me. Do you use WhatsApp? Are you looking to stop using it? And do you even care about these new changes they've announced? Let's get a conversation started down below in the comments. In other news, another day, another dark web marketplace pwned by the government. Dark Market, creative name, had 500,000 users and was dedicated to selling illegal things. The site sold a range of illegal goods, including drugs, counterfeit money, credit cards, SIM cards, malware, and other assorted contraband. Europol seized 20 servers in Moldova and Ukraine belonging to the marketplace. We seem to see a few stories like this each year. Whether it's a government takedown or an exit scam, these dark web marketplaces never seem to last. Just late last year, Empire Market seemingly exit scammed. Empire Market similarly sold an array of illegal wares. When a dark web site exit scams, they prevent customers and vendors from cashing out their Bitcoin and simply just take it all for themselves. I imagine this is really pretty lucrative and far dwarfs the measly few percent these sites typically charge as a fee. You can think of it in terms of if PayPal suddenly decided to just take all of their customers' money and run off. They'd have quite the payday. This particular case could have been catalyzed by the fact Bitcoin hit a two-year high in August last year when this all went down. Thinking it was a good time to cash out, this could have just prompted the owners to take all of their customers' money and run. If they decided to hold on to their coins, then wow, that's, that's quite the jackpot. Now, in mildly interesting things I found on the internet this week, or Mitifotty for short, that's an acronym of mildly interesting things. Yeah, I, I think we'll deprecate the acronym by the next episode. I don't know, let me, let me know what you think in the comments. Anyhow, the Signal Path channel on YouTube dissected a Starlink satellite dish and explained its inner workings. Starlink, I'm sure you know, is Elon Musk's answer to high-speed internet anywhere on Earth using low-orbit satellites. This is one of the dishes you'd have on your roof to connect to that network. It's a fascinating watch. The guy doing the explaining really knows his stuff. Also, Razer came out with the world's smartest mask. Project Hazel is a transparent N95 mask which can project your voice with its patent-pending voice amp technology. Basically, it has a built-in microphone and speaker. Oh, and it wouldn't be a Razer product without RGB, would it now? It's in the concept stage, which means you can't actually buy it and there is no release date. There's a good chance they'll never actually put it into mass production anyway, but we shall see. 
And lastly, a horror story courtesy of Bitcoin. Stefan Thomas bought 7,000 Bitcoin a few years ago. That's 7,000 Bitcoin, not, not $7,000 worth of Bitcoin. 7,000 BTC is worth about 300 million. That's a third of a billion dollars at today's price. He has all of this Bitcoin stored on an iron key USB stick, which has military grade encryption. So he's a clever guy. He got in early and stored his Bitcoin correctly. What's the, what's the big deal? Well, well, he's just gone and forgotten the password to his iron key. An iron key gives you 10 attempts to guess the correct password. After that, it just deletes everything stored on it. Mr. Thomas is on attempt number eight. I'll link the full story in the description, of course, but it's actually really quite depressing. The article talks about how he'll go to bed thinking about what the password could be. Once he has an idea, he, he rushes over to give it a go before it inevitably doesn't work and that counter increases by one. Okay, my dudes, that, that's me for this week. Make sure to smash that like button for the YouTube AI and do me a favor, leave me a detailed comment down below. Tell me what you think of this format. Any comments, any criticism, whatever, I'm completely open to it. Just give it to me. Give it to me raw. That, that sounded really wrong. <laughs> anyway, I'm genuinely, genuinely interested to hear what you guys think. Um, and stay tuned uh, for more hacking videos in the next episode, I guess. Um, yeah, goodbye.